Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unzan Chitta. I was thinking to myself at one point, how could you be so presumptuous to think that you could give a talk on the mirror of Zen? It's so San's masterwork, so San, this monk from the 16th century, translated by a current day Korean monk, translated from the uh, Chinese into Korean. And then um, it was translated from Korean into English by. Um, Hyungak Sunim. And I suspect that the feeling that I had about, oh, I really shouldn't do a talk on the mirror of Zen, it's just too, 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 was probably the sort of uh, feeling that uh, Hyungak had when asked to translate it from Korean into English. Uh, I imagine it was one of those, oh, I couldn't do that. I don't speak Korean well enough. Oh, no, someone else should know better than I that be able to translate it much more better than I could. And that's where that little voice comes in that says, I, 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 you do it. Bye-bye. <clears throat> so anyway, here we are. Um, Mira Zen, like I said, Sosan, an eminent monk from the 16th century, actually lived kind of a long time. He was born in like 1520 and died in uh, 1604, so he lasted a while. Um, and I'm not going to go through chapter by chapter. There's 85 of them, and I don't think it would serve any purpose to do that when you can read it yourself. And here's what it looks like, should you be interested in reading it, and indeed, you should. And if you don't buy the hard copy, I'm sure there's a PDF that you can pirate, but of course, we prefer that people get paid, paid for the uh, work they do. So. The way I read it, and I've been going over it a lot recently, and I've gone over it a number of times before, uh, I, I've seen that there's like 14 different sort of thematic sections going from like, what is Buddha? Why do meditation practice precepts, uh, chanting sutras and mantras, uh, monastic uh, behavior, uh, the life, death, body conundrum, uh, Zen sickness, always a good one, uh, Zen schools and attachment to Buddhas and patriarchs. And that pretty well covers a good portion of Zen teachings. He's, it's not as if he sat down and wrote this book. This is one of those things where he had these things to say and it was written down and then compiled after the fact. So you can well imagine that this is the kind of thing where uh, a situation would arise and he would address it in um, a certain way. And it's usually in not too many words, which I kind of like. So right from chapter one, and I am going to read a couple of things, uh, but right out of chapter one, right from the start, there is only one thing from the very beginning, infinitely bright and my mysterious by nature. It was never born and it never dies. It cannot be described nor given a name. So I don't know if that reminds you of anything, but 
Patriarch number six, Renang Platform Sutra. There's this dialogue toward the end where he states pretty much that word for word. And he asks, uh, so does anybody know what this bright, luminous, never born, never dying thing is? And of course, Shen Wei has to pipe up and say, oh, I know, I know, I know. It's, it's my Buddha nature. And Huining basically gives him the, weren't you paying attention? I just said it's nameless, it's formless. It has no beginning or end. Why are you saying this? And it's also the uh, dialogue between Wineng and uh, Nanwei Wairang. And when Nanwei came to the temple, uh, Wineng asked him, so what brings you here? And it took about eight years. And eventually, Nanyue's response was, to call it a thing is not correct. So what this one thing is from the very beginning, that's what we're looking for. And we don't actually have to look for it. It's right here, it's right now, on this spot. Not going anywhere. We'll quite often pile loads of manure on top of it. But as the saying goes, you can pile manure on top of a diamond. And when you scrape all that away, it's still a diamond. So if we scrape away and shovel away all that's uh, obscuring our own uh, diamond nature, uh, maybe we'll be in uh, some good shape. Uh, from, this is from chapter five. The Zen meditation tradition descends from the three situations where the Buddha transmitted his insight wordlessly from mind to mind. The Sutra transition uh, tradition rather derives from the occasions of the Buddha's spoken teachings delivered throughout his life. Therefore, it can be said that Zen is the Buddha's mind while sutras are the Buddha's words. Spoken about this before, where there seems to be sometimes a dichotomy, a dualistic approach, perhaps you could even say, about Zen being beyond words and scriptures and scriptures. As I've mentioned before, Zen practice and sutras, two sides of one hand. In fact, there's no sides, it's just one hand that happens to have two different aspects to it. The sutras will not necessarily bring you to salvation, but being as that they were the teachings of the Buddha, they're probably worthwhile looking into. Likewise, you can read all the sutras you want, and if you don't see your true nature, then that's all going to be for naught anyway. So it's important to realize that the Buddha's words are an important signpost, an important guide for the practice. We could all just sit down on a cushion sometime, just blindly having no exposure to the teachings at all, and say, oh, okay, I see my true nature. 
and be as delusional as ever before sitting on the cushion, after getting up from the cushion, miss seeing your true nature is perhaps as bad a crime as not seeing it at all. The Buddha taught for, for 49 years, right? And in that time, he did more than just raise a flower. So, you know, the teachings didn't stop with the Four Noble Truths. If that's where it ended, he could have given a PowerPoint presentation, broken for lunch, and said, okay, have at it. It's 49 years. It's a lot of words in there. And yet, in those words, are the Buddha's mind as well, just as the Buddha's mind is reflected in the Buddha's words. Here's another one, this is from uh, section 45. Just maintaining the original true mind is the supreme practice. I'll read the commentary here also. The mind that consciously thinks I am practicing or I will practice is not truly practicing, but rather deluding itself. This is why the old Zen master used to answer every question put to him. Never delude yourself. Never delude yourself. Lazy people always put things off to the future, thinking they will practice then. This is no nothing less than giving up on yourself. And how often do we find ourselves distracted and unable to concentrate on even sitting for 10 minutes without our minds wandering, even to the point where we can't sit for 10 minutes, period. Even if our, our minds are wandering, it's easy to procrastinate about practice, but as has been mentioned before also, we don't have a whole lot of time. If we're not working on seeing our true nature right now, then the opportunity to see it may be lost. <clears throat> This is uh, one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is 40, uh, in the 40s also. Some people may be under the impression that we practice Dharma in order to attain Nirvana, but this is a mistake. Mind is originally calm and perfectly clear, just as it is. Attaining this realization is true Nirvana or salvation. That is why it is taught all dharmas are originally marked by nirvana. You probably also heard that all dharmas are marked by emptiness. So what does that tell you? I'll just leave that one there. Uh, 44, if while encountering myriad situations, your mind does not give rise to thinking, this is what we mean by unborn. The unborn nature is before thinking, and before thinking itself is nirvana or salvation. The commentary uh, goes into discussion of the threefold practice meditation, concentration, samadhi, and wisdom. When we act according to our nature, when we have that gut, just uh, intuitive, reflexive response to situations where we 
respond appropriately uh, to a given situation, that's when we're acting out of our true nature. That's when we're expressing our true nature. That, that moment before thought. I often use this example of there being a little girl that's going to run into traffic and these two, we'll call them monks for the purpose of this discussion. There's two monks standing on the street corner and they're seeing this little kid and she's running into traffic. Before thinking, the one of them grabs her and drags her back onto the sidewalk before she can get hit by a car. The other monk, well, he was thinking about, well, is this the right thing to do? What if the mother gets mad at me for, you know, pulling his, her child back? If it were up to him, um, well, splat. We keep practicing, 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 practicing to the point where we have that uh, me mental muscle memory, if you like, that we can respond to situations correctly with the correct function. I don't think any of us came into practice like knowing exactly how to handle every situation in a, in a skillful way. I know I didn't anyway. As practice develops, and I'm exposed to more situations and I'm exposed to more teachings and I'm exposed to more teachers and I'm exposed to all of you, then things become a little clearer. Some of the mental manure gets brushed aside and the diamond nature starts to shine through. It's like, I don't know, one of the people in front of me here is a musician on a number of different instruments. I'm guessing that he probably didn't just sit down at a piano one day and rip into, um, you know, some blues progression just off the top of his head. It came because the muscles were developed. Power practice, musical practice, same thing. We practice, we get better. <clears throat> Excuse me. We get better at it. We become more reflexive to the point where we don't actually have to think in order to respond correctly. Um, and I want to close with something out of Mirror of Zen also, which is a wonderful quote. The sacred radiance of our original nature never darkens. It has shined forth since beginningless time. Do you wish to enter the gate that leads to this? Simply do not give rise to conceptual thinking. 